Good morning. What an honor it is to be here today, to be in this moment with all of you, and to be the beneficiary in so many ways of the brilliance that is Simone Lee, whose work and whose friendship has moved so many of us across oceans, through space, and beyond time. Thank you to Rashida Bumbre for gathering us with such prescience and skill and grace, and to Saidia Hartman and Tina Camp, to Rebecca Adib and Susan Thompson and Emily Mello, and to the whole team that has made this gathering possible. I'm so thrilled to share this window of conversation with Kinesia, Deborah, and Mabel, and so look forward to hearing each of their words. Thank you, too, to the young people uh, who inspire my small one to be here in this beloved community. Uh, and thank you to Georgia May uh, for being a travel partner whose patience, flexibility, and rapturous engagement with the world is unrivaled. I'm so deeply moved to be here. So what I'd like to share this morning is from an essay that I'm currently writing called Gone to Ground. One, of a fox or other animal, to enter its earth or burrow, as in, rabbits evicted from one set of burrows will go to ground elsewhere. Two, of a person, to hide, go into seclusion, or become inaccessible, especially for a long time, as in, she had gone to ground following the coup. How have you survived? How have you maintained during this collective adaptation. Tiffany Lathabo King asked a group of us gathered for a virtual conversation this spring. Riffing on Octavia Butler's use of the term collective adaptation, describing the kinds of rapid evolution she both imagined and observed in the face of world historical change, Butler summoned adaptive visions for futures to be made for horizons to come. How have we survived? How have me and my now five-year-old weathered these last disabling, debilitating, disorienting years? We have gathered ourselves and the smallest circles of our people, was my reply. We've gone to ground. I'd like to ask you to think with me today about the possibilities that going to ground might open up for those of us who care about survivance, about sovereignty, about freedom, and like Sylvia Winter, about seeking a reconstructed understanding of the very grounds of human being. We come from long traditions of reaping from the ground, sustaining ourselves with ground provision, harvesting bush medicine, and of making fallow land fertile fields. But how might going to ground in this period make possible something we urgently need now? Zora Neale Hurston calls plants ground thoughts. She writes, I reckon my longing to get away makes me feel this way. I feel that I am just earth, Soil lying helpless to move myself, but thinking. I seem to hear herds of big beasts like horses and cows thundering over me, and rains beating down, and wind sweeping furiously over, all acting upon me, but me, well, just soil, feeling but not able to take part in it all. Then a soft wind like love passes over and warms me, and a summer rain comes down like understanding and softens me, and I push a blade of grass or a flower or maybe a pine tree. That's the ground thinking. Plants are ground thoughts because the soil can't move itself. What might it mean to feel like earth, like soil lying helpless to move itself, like ground as a site for thinking, like plant as the instantiation of our visions of ourselves and of our world? In this 1921 short story, John Redding Goes to Sea, Hurston asks us to consider the limitations of linking freedom dreams to mobility and liberation to lines of flight. Instead, she trains our attention on the most immobile of subjects and sites, the ground inhabited by the vast majority of us, by black folks who experience inordinate material and geophysical barriers to our abilities to physically move. She reimagines those grounds as fertile, generative sites for feeling, and perhaps more importantly, for thinking. Our grounds might push a blade of grass or a flower or a pine tree into the world. And for Hurston, each is a carrier of ground wisdom about the world. Botanists have long studied plant physiology and now offer us intriguing insights into plant signaling and intelligence. Plant ecologists continue to micro-scale into the environments that bring plant and animal life into relation. 
Contemporary scholars in critical plant studies ask more elusive questions about herbaceous modes of being and becoming that loop us back through time to older philosophical questions about vitality and the constitution of life. My own thinking about sentient soil and about the vegetation that emerges from it is deeply influenced by the work of Hurston and that of Suzanne Césaire, two figures emblematic of traditions of black feminist inquiry, anglophone and francophone, ethnographic and literary, forged in times of world historical transformation, not unlike our own. Taken together, they offer us a reflection on representations of the primitive and the plant, and invested instead in metaphors, uh, I'm sorry, resistant to the pitfalls of tropicalizing representations of the primitive and the plant, and invested instead in metaphors materiality, and as Annie Curtius highlights for us, to its possible horizons as method. Plants emerge here as subjects rather than mere objects. They are not just good to think, but are modes of inhabitation we are wise to remember were once part of the cycle of our being and will again irremediably be our own. Dust to dust, ashes to ashes, ashes to sand, sand to rock, rock to clay, clay to soil, soil to plant. Suzanne Césaire, in her own turn, calls us hommes plant, or plant people. In a 1942 essay in Tropique, the journal she, her husband Aimé, and fellow writers and theorists René Menil, Lucie Thézé, and Aristide Moget ran in World War II, Vichy occupied Martinique. Annette Joseph Gabriel interprets Césaire's invocation thus. The homme plant is one who does not seek to dominate nature, but rather allows himself to be possessed, moved along by the force of life. For Suzanne Césaire, the Martiniquean homme plant rejects the impulse to conquer and dominate and refuses the violent, destructive impulse that fueled the war machine of the 1940s. For Césaire, that period of life demanded an urgent task. As she wrote, it is now vital to dare to know oneself, to dare to confess to oneself what one is, to dare to ask oneself what one wants to be. Here also people are born, live, and die. Here also the entire drama is what uh, is played out. Both a call for Martinican liberation and an affirmation of the political centrality of non-European places Suzanne Césaire insisted that despite its small size and seeming global insignificance, Martinique was an arena in which a more universal question of freedom might find meaningful elaboration. And for her, that happened under the sign of the plant. Refusing a reduction of post-plantation freedom dreams to a base form of, pure, of bureaucratic political parody, Suzanne Césaire's recuperation of the vegetal offers us something prescient in our orientation toward a wider set of decolonial desires. Her invocation of the vegetal is a refusal of the monocrop plantation economy and a demand instead for a rhythm of universal life unstructured by the plantation form. Together, Hurston and Césaire offer us a vision for what it might mean to think ourselves not merely as consumers, tenders, or laborers in the world of plants, but as being closer to plant life than we often imagine. If plants are ground thoughts, going to ground is a demand for a politics that both takes on board the consequences of colonial incursion and forges new modes of relationality between plants and people. Together, they also insist that we attend to moments in human life that verge, as Michael Martyr observes, on the vegetal. Betsy Ann Wansley Young spent the last years of her life, nearly a decade of them, bedbound, unable to move her body on its right side, for a time only able to murmur, and then eventually unable to speak. Before those years, she was a founding member of the staff of People Magazine, a photographer and editor with a love of brandy and of brie, both the consumables and her Yorkshire Terriers, one named for each. She was my mother's older and only sibling and my beloved taunt, the adult who I clung to in my early years. They called us Big Toot and Little Toot. Um, in, oh, sorry, I'm weeping. I didn't know I was gonna do that. Um, uh, thank you, <laughs> thanks. Uh, they called us Big Toot and Little Toot uh, until in 1985, she was diagnosed with multiple meningiomas, non-malignant tumors of the brain and spinal cord that, at the time, were near impossible to treat. When surgery after surgery chipped away at her brain's gray matter, 
she ended up spending years verging on what medical practitioners formally, formally call a vegetative state. Our meninges, the places where her tumors were lodged, have three layers. The inner fragile pia mater, the webby arachnoid middle filled with fluid, and the outer shell, true to its name, the dura mater. In the hierarchy of vertebrate and invertebrate animal life, forms of meninges help define the orders, the ranks, the lethal categories of valuation that have long made mess of human and non-human relation in the so-called West. Our meninges matter to how we think the order of our worlds. Yet, our pia mater is the site of capillary action, bringing blood to the brain and spinal cord. The self-same mechanism in plants, capillary action, draws water from roots to xylem, stamen to, to stem. Annie Dillard reminds us that there is only a tiny difference between the lifebloods of plants and animals. One molecule of chlorophyll contains 36 atoms of hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon arrayed around an atom of magnesium. A molecule of hemoglobin is exactly the same, differentiated only by a single atom, iron for magnesium. And via capillary action, all of our bodies defy gravity. When this action is blocked for humans, when riddled with masses of unanticipated cell growth, like tumors, that twinning becomes even more profound. From the outside, we seem to start to verge on the vegetal. My taunt's body moves slowly toward this state of being, eventually ceasing all manner of primary and secondary function. But before that, when I came to sit by her bedside, when her husband translated her grunts and gestures to me, her eyes lit up, that mind, those ground thoughts, still there. Like Martha in Audre Lorde's epic poem about a former lover, bedbound, moving slowly toward death too, her thoughts not over, Lord writes, no one you were can come cl so close to death without dying into another Martha. You cannot get closer to death than this Martha, the nearest you've come to living yourself. My child asks after my taunt about death, about what happens to bodies when we go, about what happens to minds. I have few answers for her, but I do have this. We go to ground. I watch as she lays in what she calls the grassy place near our home and wonder what she imagines of her body's relation to soil, of her thinking self's kinship to the vibrant ecologies beneath her, of the ground that greets her now and one day will again. Going to ground can happen in so many ways, mostly involuntary, defined by both individual and population level scales of injury, collective debilitation, and hands forced, with earth swallowing imagined as punishment rather than prize. Since the year 2000, my aunt has been the inhabitant of a plot at Flushing Cemetery in Queens, itself once a center of horticultural innovation, shared with her parents and grandmother. Now a crepe myrtle grows between their gravestones. Taunt has gone to ground, and among the living, so have I. I would wager that so many of us uh, gathered here too, having recently experienced a, parad a paradigmatic slowing of a delirious pace of being in the world, of our social media signaling, our schedule packing, our social frenzy, our endless laboring in the service of corporate profit, um, as earlier phases of the pandemic, in some places at some times, decelerated the velocity of life such that our actions became barely perceptible. How have we survived this collective adaptation? We have gathered ourselves in the smallest circles of our people, and we have gone to ground. And what an opportunity we now have to hear what kinds of vegetal efflorescence of ground thoughts this gathering might now bring to life. Thank you.